Again, welcome everyone. This is the second seminar in our IPP research seminar series. And today we are particularly pleased to have uh, Professor Padmashvi uh, Jel Sampat from Harvard and Els Torell also from IPP to discuss with us a very topical issue. Um, we were just discussing before the seminar that just today the European Investment Bank has announced a significant investment in partnership with the London government and the government in Senegal to develop uh, production capacity for vaccine uh, for COVID. And actually, uh, this is exactly the topic we are going to look at with uh, our uh, speaker today. Uh, Padmashri has a very long uh, standing track of research and work in this, in this field. She's a leading expert in technology development and broader issues around the global political economy of development. Uh, she's a fellow uh, at Harvard University Beckham Klein Center, and is also senior advisor of the Global Access in Action Initiative there. Uh, she's also currently a visiting professor at the South African Research Chair in Industry Development, um, based at the University of Johannesburg, and also has other affiliation with the United Nations, and in particular the World Health Organization, who is the chair of the Technical Advisory Group on COVID-19 Technologies uh, Access uh, Pool. So today we are particularly lucky to have Padmashi uh, giving us a perspective on the opportunities and the challenges that uh, are uh, uh, faced by many countries who are trying to address the shortage of uh, vaccine in the global south production vaccine in a number of countries, in particular in the African continent. And we will have in the second part of the seminar, um, Els Torell uh, joining us for uh, sharing also some first reaction before we open the floor uh, for further discussion. Else is also a fellow at IPP, has been for several decades, for a couple of decades, I would say, uh, working in this field and uh, first as part of Medicine uh, Without Border, Doctor Without Border, but also more recently working in the WHO um, Initiative for Economics for Health for All, which is chaired also by Mariana Mazzucato here at IPP. So thanks else as well to, for joining us. Uh, as usual, we will record this event. There are a number of people who cannot attend given clashes. So we are happy to have this uh, uploaded in our YouTube channel. Um, we will run the seminar as usual, uh, having a first presentation of 30, 40 minutes. We will have then a first reaction from health and then we will open the floor for a comments, discussion, question, and uh, you will be uh, very much welcome to raise your hand and I will uh, upload you to the panel so you will be able to ask directly the question or if you prefer you can also post in the chat. So without further ado, uh, Padmashi, thanks so much again for, for being here with us today and we look forward to your uh, uh, presentation. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you very much for this invitation. I'm really, uh, I'm really pleased to be here and also to interact with you and Els and um, the rest of the participant. So um, I'm going to, okay, everybody can see the screen, I suppose. I just have to start, okay. So, um, I mean, the topic of my presentation today is local production of vaccines, a capabilities approach. And it's uh, what I'm gonna speak today is really based on um, one of the papers that was circulated as background for the seminar, but it's also drawing, on a couple of other uh, field work and papers that I have um, done or are pending. So I wanna start with um, um, giving us a sort of a, all of us a sort of a background on, on what's been going on in terms of local production uh, of vaccines uh, from the start of the pandemic. So if we uh, look at the emergence of solutions, um, we've, we've have had at least two approaches broadly. So the first approach has been um, a very narrow, straight-jacketed one, which looks at um, tackling the supply crunch in uh, so-called vaccine supply impediments, uh, sort of vial shortages, fermenting bags, stoppers, other intermediate inputs, which has uh, slowed down production pipelines and delayed shipments to countries from major pharma companies, right? And as part of this first approach, the broader thinking is that 
it's sufficient to facilitate voluntary collaborations between global pharmaceutical companies and other vaccine manufacturers, including those located in developing countries that have already proven their capacity to produce, right? Then a second approach is a more structural one, and it draws on the fact that there have been very long-standing technological divides between the global north and the global south. Technology has been a major hindrance to industrialization and to the development of core capacity in certain sectors in low-income countries. And in this approach, the emphasis is to use COVID-19 as a sort of a trigger to address long-standing gaps in access by creating disseminating manu disseminated manufacturing, particularly in some regions where we've had no manufacturing capacity of any significance. And by that, I mean Africa. So um, a large part of the work that uh, I will present today, for instance, deals directly with the situation that's ongoing in Africa, but it also applies to, uh, in, in, in broad measure, to most of the developing world, depending on the level of development. So these two approaches basically have led to three kinds of activities around vaccine supply for Africa. And for just the ease of setting the stage for the rest of the presentation, I've, I've, I've sort of like put them up on this slide here the first kind of activities are crisis stage operations, right? So basically when the crisis broke out, we had COVID-19, we had needed a solution. Mid-2020 COVAX facility was established. COVAX facility is jointly led by the WHO, CEPI and Gavi Alliance. And what it seeks to do is to make sure that there is a steady supply of vaccines in low and middle income countries that covers to preliminarily at least 20% of their population. And the COVAX facility has a certain priority setting. It wants to cover 20% with the priority on healthcare professionals, people with comorbidities and aged populations in low-income countries. Then between November 2020 and May 2021, we also saw actually the emergence of a large number of vaccine demand and supply capacity studies and mapping conducted by a variety of international agencies like the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiative, CEPI, the British FDCO, and so on. And then in May 2021, you had the creation of something that's called the COAX Manufacturing Task Force, which has three work streams. Work stream one and two is particularly focused on the market-led approach that I just highlighted in my past slide, which is really to alleviate the short-term supply chain impediments to basically grease the wheels so that large pharmaceutical firms can quickly produce more doses for supply globally. The second set of activities is supply expansion operations, which is really looking at how can we facilitate more voluntary licenses between large pharma firms, which have front runner candidates for vaccines against COVID and companies that have some level of capacity in the developing world. So if you trace this, you can see that AstraZeneca has had many deals with the Serum Institute of India, then SK Biosciences, Fio Cruz, in Brazil and our pharma in Russia. Gamalaya Institute in Russia has now created at least 10 voluntary licensing deals with different agencies. This is something I've covered in a recently published paper of mine. And there are lots of other voluntary licenses which are sort of like um, ongoing, including one between Johnson & Johnson and Aspen Pharmaceuticals in South Africa for the manufacturing of 400 million doses. Now, the other third kind of activity is what I would like to call a local production redux. And I call it a local production redux because this is not the first time we have a re-emphasis on local production. Every time there is a major public health crisis, and, I, and this is some, but people working in public health will agree with me, and especially for a long time like else, 
we will we always go back to addressing local production and then after some time somehow the interest wanes or those initiatives succeed or not succeed we move on the last time was the hiv aids crisis and now we have a local production redux since last year which is because of basically the covid 19 crisis and this one of the major events here was a vaccine manufacturing summit held on the 12th and 13th of 2020 by the african union and the africa cdc which brought together other players to, to signal the ambition of the continent or the region to say it's time for us to leverage capacity to build really uh, a regional production um, a pipeline for vaccines, right? And based on that, there have been a lot of other um, donors, agencies, and as Antonio just mentioned, the European Investment Bank and the European Union has a Team Europe initiative now, which is pledged up to 1 billion US dollars, euros in this, in this initiative. And a range of um, collaborations are underway, right? As part of this, a significant thing is also um, Workstream 3 of the COVAX Manufacturing Task Force, which is an mRNA hub, which was conceptualized to be the first mRNA hub in South Africa, facilitated through the, the World Health Organization. Now, before we go on to th think what to do and what does this mean, first I want us to focus on some facts on how does the vaccine sector look and what does this really mean. So first, the vaccine sector is a heavily concentrated sector. So the full picture of what it takes to produce vaccines and who produces what is not easy to come by because data between value-based sales of vaccines, which is in high-income countries, and volume-based sales of vaccines, which is majorly focused in low- and middle-income countries, is usually fragmented, and it's not available easily. So if you go to data sets in, in, uh, for, for procurement, they cover low- and medium-income countries. Whereas here, what we tried to do, and this is the paper that uh, um, much of this, this presentation is based on. Um, me and my co-author, we actually tried to create a data set to understand how um, concentrated the vaccine sector is and how, is, how does it look when you target the value come volume split. And what it, this figure here shows is that if you take the top 10, uh, so, if it, so on the whole, 80% of the value-based sales globally are still captured by big pharma, okay? And 20% of the value is captured by developing country manufacturers, okay? But if you take it from a volume perspective, okay? This is how the split looks. If you take it from a volume perspective, you see that out of the top 10 firms which cater to the global market, about seven of them are from the developing world today. And out of those five are from India, which I've listed here. There's one from Indonesia and one from Ru Russia. And three companies still belong to the global north. And this changed market structure split by value and volume has been facilitated over the past 20 odd years by the Gavi Alliance, which basically tried to shift the way uh, vaccines are supplied to the developing world by pooling procurement. While this led to the entry of several what are now called developing country vaccine manufacturers or DCVMs, there are major market issues. And these remain to the question of split markets, which is what I mentioned. There is an 80-20 split. So 80% of the volume, 20% of the value, and 20% of the value, but 80% of the volume between uh, uh, Big Pharma and uh, other manufacturers. There is also major difficulties of breaking into the R&D league. So of all these companies that are supplying in the top 10 vo volume wise, only three companies have been able to introduce new products. In uh, Actually, it's only two. Serum Institute of India has introduced two products, one for rotavirus and one for the pneumococcal uh, virus. And there is only one other firm, which is actually Bharat Biotech, which has only introduced one product uh, in the last 20 years. So now here, I'm not looking at the big pharma, I'm looking at current production capacity, which is just production capacity to produce any kind of vaccines. 
So outside of India, some capacity exists in countries like Bangladesh, Indonesia, South Korea, and these production operations, especially because they are driven by large economies of scale for cost savings, okay, they are they are basically also leading to a concentrated vaccine sector. So if you take the vaccine sector as a whole today, including all the big pharma firms and developing country firms, what you see is that in every vaccine category, there are mainly only two or three suppliers. And um, this is part of an analysis that I just finished conducting and will be published soon. But this is basically telling us that there are large capacity barriers, even for developing country manufacturers. And these capacity barriers are related to standards, technology, finance. And then there's also a problem of setting up physical production capacity. And these physical production capacity differences are not negligible. Right. So, for instance, the BioVac Institute, which is now one of the biggest vaccine producing firms in, in Africa, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, its best production capacity was 10, 10 million filling lines per annum. This is not much when compared with Serum Institute of India, which is producing 79 million COVID-19 doses per month. And that's just for COVID-19. So if you take the, my previous slide, Serum Institute of India is actually uh, producing uh, a huge amount of vaccines by million doses. It actually had in 2017 already 864 million doses per annum. And in 2018, it was over 1 billion. And, and now it's actually producing even more in 2021. Now, and this, this structure of the market is not helped by COVID-19. What COVID-19 has done is that it has led to a market explosion of the vaccines market. So you see an at least 2.5% rise in terms of value. So from a global vaccines market of 28 billion, we're looking at about 185 billion US dollars in 2021. And it has led to a 5.5 times rise in terms of volume. So from 4.85 billion doses, in 2021, we should expect a total of around 12 billion doses produced all over the world. And this is not just for COVID, it's all vaccines, right? And the COVID-19 pipeline shows new player entry. So if you take the WHO's draft pipeline of you know, all the players who are in the phase one, phase two, phase three, and so on, you see a lot of new entrants of new names of vaccine producing companies that you had never heard before. But what you see is that there is still a persistence of winner take all effects, right? So the first few players who hit the mark are the players who get the market, okay? And as an example, and this is very important because this is, this is something when I interview developing country vaccine manufacturers, this is a major issue. So in many vaccine categories, the firms that manage to produce and the, the firms that manage to grow to scale are the firms that actually supply at the cheapest cost to international procurement, right? So there's a winner takes all effect in sort of cost-based production itself. But this is even worse when you take into account R&D. And here, for instance, I have on this slide a comparison of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, where because you had actually huge market sales for uh, Moderna and uh, Pfizer BioNTech uh, uh, vaccines, Sanofi recently dropped out of the market. It dropped out of the market, and the main reason given was really that there was no place to play. There was already enough vaccine supply. The, and so for those of us who want more market entry, the real silver lining is Clover Pharmaceuticals, which is still in the running and which has an mRNA COVID-19 candidate. And why is Clover in the running? Because it has a large domestic market. It has already a procurement contract from uh, COVAX for 400 million doses. And this is something that we need to bear in mind because this is a very complex market. So then the other thing that, that's going on is that there's a technological dominance of a few firms. So when you um, interview firms, you also hear things like you cannot produce mRNA vaccines, even if we license the technology because you have no skilled personnel, right? So there is sort of a, it's, 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 um, it's a fait accompli in many ways, actually, to justify the technological divide. And it comes with new informal valuations of existing technology platforms. So in the sense that 
you have four prominent vaccine technology platforms today, live attenuated and whole inactivated. And then you have viral vector and recombinant platforms. And what the whole market um, has, um, the COVID-19 market has done is that it has led to a sort of an informal evaluation of the vaccine platforms to, towards a preference for viral vector and recombinant vaccines at the expense of live attenuated and whole inactivated vaccines, as though those focusing on live attenuated and whole inactivated vaccines are not really technology intensive. These are not the areas where we might make a large amount of money. So we need to rethink whether we need to invest more R&D skills into it, right? So, so as a result, there's a major boost, and now once again, I put it in, 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 in inverted commas, there's a major boost to production activity in Africa. And if you take the list of, of initiatives that are ongoing, and this table, by the way, I compiled it, and it's constantly growing, and this is made, these are the, the, the salient um, manufacturing partnerships that matter. These are all ongoing um, until August 2021, when Rwanda has announced a BioNTech um, collaboration for malaria vaccine. And there's now a similar malaria vaccine collaboration for BioNTech in Senegal. But all of these mostly focus on plant relocation for fill and finish. They're not focusing on anything more than fill and finish. And that the whole thing, when you break it down, right, the vaccine sector, how it's split between value and volume, and what it's what COVID-19 is doing to new product entry and re-evaluation of the technological intensity of the process, and how we are trying to build capacity in this very complex uh, sector, is a bit contrary to what both theory and practice tells us about how we should go about building capacity in this sector. Now, what does theory and practice tell us? So the first thing is that, and here I'm now trying to really sort of stylistically summarize something that we know from two decades of sectoral studies on pharma and a lot of work on the vaccine sector. So the first thing we definitely know is that building capacity to produce in the pharmaceuticals and vaccine sector, or any sector actually, you need actually enterprise level capabilities, right? Now these kinds of enterprise level or firm level capabilities are broadly describing the opportunities, the choices and the options that are available to firms in any country or context to produce and expand product baskets. And that's influenced in theory by a number of factors that we can actually identify, like the presence of a skilled workforce, the influx of new technologies, a conducive policy uh, environment, including actually in industrial policy, then market access for firms that produce. Um, there's, there's, this can be a longer list, but these are the main factors. But this capacity to produce, even in this case, fill and finish, although it's part of the overall capacity to innovate, right? So we always think that when you start producing, you're embarking on a journey that leads you somewhere from production to innovation. This is how firms learn. Um, I, the problem here is that this capacity to produce, although it's part of this chain to innovate, it's not sufficient to promote longer term capabilities that sustain the pharmaceutical sector. Of course, you know, in the short term, the knowledge base of firms grows on the basis of these kinds of routine learning by doing activities that we know. But this is different from the kind of learning by imitating activities that we need. And it's different, even more different from the kinds of learning by experimentation and learning by inquiry activities that we actually need for dynamic transformation. Okay, so at a fundamental level to understand what we need today for a firm in Senegal or South Africa to produce, we can ask the question, what is the mix of vocational and professional skills needed by firms to start manufacturing this product? This is something that, you know, we have, we have been asking in the context of the mRNA hub. Okay, but over time, the question we need to ask is different. The question we need to ask in three to five years is that, what has this firm been producing and why has this firm only been producing this, right? And is this 
And when you ask that question in the field, then you understand that the answer to why firms produce what they produce is a complex mix of financial, technological, and industrial ecosystem related factors, okay? And those capabilities that actually allow firms to not just get stuck in producing what they learn narrowly today in a particular knowledge pool and that allow them to expand are based on what is called collective capabilities. And these are capabilities that build on a couple of things. One, they build on a diverse and complexity of knowledge pools. So we don't only need biotechnologists, so we don't only need chemists, but we actually need scientists, we need researchers who can actually come together with a wide range of vocational and professional skills and have diverse collaborative norms, which mediate their interactions, and start thinking out of the box to say, okay, when we learn to imitate, can we learn to tweak it a little bit? Can we use this technology in a particular way to solve a localized problem, to meet localized demand? And how can we actually mix and match these knowledge pools in certain ways, right? So although policy, technology, and market access intermediate that kind of learning process, they intermediate that kind of learning process in a completely different way in a dynamic setting, right? And Evidence from the vaccine sector, if you take actually, um, you know, my field service, for instance, in India and in Bangladesh or in South Korea and Indonesia now in the vaccine sector shows that these real options, okay, what companies can produce and how companies then choose to produce it, okay, depends on a completely different set of questions. For instance, they all start out with some gaps and skills and some gaps and capabilities and so on, even if they access external technology, right? But what matters is to look at what routines have firms developed over time to fill these gaps, right? And how do firms creatively engage in collaborating with other institutions internally and externally so that firm level production proceeds in a certain directionality where they add value? Okay, and here is where it becomes useful to go to the field, because in some contexts you see that firms just sort of like uh, retract, they don't occupy markets, they sort of go backwards, they say okay we cannot produce so we're just going to distribute or we're going to produce very little. Okay, and this is something you also saw in the pharmaceutical sector, but in some of the sectors, like in Bangladesh, for instance, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, when I conducted field service of the pharma sector there, they were not producing vaccines, they had huge difficulties, but today Bangladeshi firms are producing vaccines. And they're trying to produce more and more of these vaccines and they're trying to become actually compliant with international standards and protocols so that they can actually participate in these procurement protocols. So they go in another direction. And these are important. And why this happens is because there is a very interactive dynamic mix of capabilities. Uh, finance and market access. So uh, questions become different when you look at it from a dynamic perspective, not just how do we build workforce, but how do we ensure markets? If markets are not available, how can we shape them? And how can we actually facilitate firms to collaborate in a different way? And what, how can we facilitate a mix of technological options and a mix of knowledge pools for these firms to access? And so, um, so, you know, it's a complex exercise that calls on a combination of not just classical industrial policy incentives for market creation, but we also need to mobilize longer term in investments for productive activities in these countries, but we also need to actively engage in shaping markets. And this, if you take this learning from developing country vaccine manufacturers and apply it to what's going on in Africa today, it's at odds with reality. Okay, the first thing that we see is that these supply expansion activities that we're talking about, right, is, in, is a real threat actually to establishing African companies to produce COVID-19. Now here on the left side, this is a sort of a production projection that we've created based on what's happening for every quarter from 2021 until the end of 2022 for um, uh, COVID-19 vaccines, okay? So the, it's when you read this graph, you have to look at the area below the curve to understand when the product, when the demand is going to get saturated in these markets, okay? So we have production uh, pro projections until end of 2022. So by quarter four of 2022, we know that the big pharma today can produce sufficient vaccines 
Okay. Now here, I'm not going to go into, uh, you know, price reneging, product hoarding, and so on. Okay. I'm just looking at supply pipelines, right? So the big farmer today can produce sufficient vaccines by the fourth quarter of 2022, so that everybody on a global scale can get two doses of COVID-19 vaccines, right? Now, we don't know how else the market will develop over the next one year because this is a volatile market. You have multiple product entries forecasted over the next six to eight months. A large number of international agencies and especially COVAX are on a two-year campaign mode, okay? But what you can say is that at the end of 2022, it's highly likely that you only have the demand for booster doses, okay? Or we are going to have different demand if COVID-19, if you know, transforms in a different way, right? Okay. But let's take the, you know, cautious interpretation. We have demand just for booster doses by 2023. Most of the production activities that have started today, none of them are going to yield fruit before 2023, right? So if you focus narrowly on COVID-19 vaccines, what you're ge generally creating is that you're going to have a situation in 2023 where you're going to pit African companies, which actually invested roughly about 100 to 300 million US dollars in setting up an mRNA production facility, with a globally saturated market, multiple number of layers, and already cost competitive supply through international procurement channels, okay? And this is something that we should definitely avoid, but this is exactly where we're headed, right? So come 2023, the question you need to ask for these new initiatives is, which product should they produce if COVID-19 vaccines are totally not needed? What are the markets they should supply to if international procurement is already secured by other companies? And what ways exist for them to diversify and change production baskets to ensure financial fungibility, okay? In finance, unfortunately, oh, unfortunately, these are not the questions we are asking. So in finance, the key focus of the discussions, especially around the mRNA hub and other manufacturing activities in Africa has been that there is a lower cost for modular manufacturing. So we can actually make sure that plants are constructed elsewhere and transposed to Africa, that it's also easier to do it and the timeline is shorter, okay? Then we have a lot of discussion on the estimates to set up plants, as I said, between 100 million to 300 million, and from where are we going to mobilize it and which bank or dedicated financial institution can source this. But this comes at the expense of a systemic discussion on how are we going to apportion the true risks associated with lack of system infrastructure? Because we, are, we need to look at something wider than just workforce creation to produce tomorrow morning or next year. And the higher cost of goods, because some COVID-19 vaccines today, like the mRNA vaccine that we have from both Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna, they are um, not heat stable. Okay, and there are higher costs of goods associated with these vaccine supply chains. But there are other potential possibilities like Genova Pharmaceuticals Biotech in India is actually coming up with a heat stable uh, version of mRNA vaccines. There are the universals. Um, there is other firms that are trying to produce this. But we don't have a systematic approach to mapping production options according to their suitability in the African context for production. Okay, we haven't engaged in it until now. There's also political risks. Now, there are political risks related to intellectual property, market access, and changing configurations, which I'll go to in a bit. And there's the question of production diversification. What are firms going to do with this vaccine technology once you give them the technology to produce COVID-19 vaccines? Now, let's take an example of the mRNA hub in South Africa to highlight some of these problems. So this is how this, this is the most simplistic depiction of the mRNA hub you're going to find if you look for images on this mRNA hub. And I did this on purpose because this is how the mRNA hub really looks like today, okay? Now, what we know is that we have Afrogen Biotech, which is the company where the technology will be embedded, and that's the hub. This is something we know for sure. The other thing we know for sure is that we have the BioVac Institute, which is going to produce these vaccines, okay? 
which is the spoke. The other spokes in this initiative have not been settled and we don't know them. And most importantly, the external technology provider, which should actually supply the COVID-19 technology to Afrogen, is not clear. It's currently the largest problem in the South African mRNA hub. So much so that recently the discussion has shifted to trying to figure out whether there can be new ways to reverse engineer the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine technology so that it can be transferred to South Africa for production in South Africa. Or could we produce other kinds of vaccines in this mRNA hub and not focus on COVID-19 at all? And this comes against the backdrop of announcements such as that by Moderna, that Moderna is gonna set up its own plant in Africa, right? So this is, this is basically what's, what's going on there, okay? Now, the other real issues that we have not sorted out when you go into the South African case is that, and you try to extrapolate that to any kind of hub that you want to create in Africa is that we have not sorted out the intellectual property issues. And by that, I don't mean how many patents, because we also have a lot of studies now scoping how many patents, and that's a very important issue that we need to consider. We also need to consider whether there are requirements to access other intellectual property. And by that, I don't mean patents held and licensed to current owners. I also, by that, I mean trade secrets, other kinds of know-how, industrial practices, and so on. But also, where are these intellectual property registered? Because when you produce in a country, which markets you can export to is also determined by whether these intellectual property are registered in those other markets. The second issue is we have not considered manufacturing. So what are the real cost of goods? How do we actually restructure these vaccine supply chains? Okay. And how can we save costs by restructuring these vaccine supply chains when compared to the large investments that we are expecting producers to make in this? Okay. Then another thing is the cost of maintaining these facilities. Um, in the paper that we circulated, we go into a deep dive, we take a deep dive into what does it really mean for African firms to set up these plants for the manufacture of pandemic vaccines, you know, because the OPEX cost, the operational cost of such a plant is about $250,000 a year. And if you're not going to recover that by selling something else over the period of time, they're going to go bust. So finance is not just about providing finance today for firms to start the plans, but it's thinking about the right, right business model in which to provide finance, right? Firms need to break even and expand production markets. So the question is not about working capital or capital, it's about assured market access, diversified technological access, collaborative capacity building, transfer of tech know-how, and making real money available for this entire process, a whole gamut of things that we need. And here, this is something that I've just discussed, so I'm going to skim over this. So technology, once again, when you take a look at the mRNA hub and also all the other fin and finish uh, activities in Africa today, we're thinking about production. But when you think about production, it's not enough. You have to really think about innovation. One of the things I discovered in the early 2000s when I did actually um, a sectoral survey of the Indian pharmaceutical sector was that firms were struggling when India really became uh, patent compliant with the TRIPS agreement after 2005, because firms did not know how, because they were competing with each other on brand names, right? There was generic branded competition in the Indian market. And they had to move from that idea of com competition to a more collaborative networking idea of making products, innovating, right? So they had to start thinking about contract research and manufacturing possibilities between local firms, you know, more closely uh, collaborating with public research institutes and other domestic inventors. And this did not come easy to the firms because the policy emphasis matters. In fact, actually, Antonio, one of the things that, you know, in this book that you just produced on, on structural transformation in, in South Africa, Nimrod Salk's chapter stands out for the same reason, right? Because he writes about how, you know, the, the emphasis of policymakers and the emphasis of the policy framework really matters. You know, if you emphasize on production, it's something different than emphasizing on production on a continuum towards innovation, okay? So, and even this production has been problematic because uh, I recently spoke to Patrick Tipu, who is actually the head of the BioVac Institute. And he said, you know, uh, if we have 18 months to produce, we can produce if we have the technology, 
right? But they don't even have the technology to start producing. And but moving beyond production, the issues relate not just to workforce creation, right? The issues create really to relate to market shaping. They relate to technology transfer. They relate to push funding for the emergence of these triggers to collective learning and local market dynamics. And I won't go into this, but this is what really market shaping in the vaccine sector really amounts to. And this is what we really need to be looking at, but we are not doing that. Um, so taking this into account, um, in our paper, we have some proposals on linking uh, market shaping more structurally with local production. So we argue in this paper, for instance, that there should be a focus on introducing wider vaccine platforms in the selection processes. We should not really go just with mRNA because it's the new thing, a new kid on the block but we should really actually also build capacity across the four platforms. And we should leverage synergies between those four vaccine platforms and regional epidemic needs, epidemiological needs. One of the things that um, I'm trying to work is to build a um, business model um, in, in West Africa. And else this is similar to what you were just saying, I think but to look at how actually the viral vector technology transfer, which is now structured with IPD can be used actually to produce new vaccines in the flavivirus categories, you know, so Zika virus and other kinds of viruses, which have regional epidemiological purposes, but there's a market, a whole market there that's not catered to. Then to learn from the developing country vaccine manufacturing network successes, meaning that, if you go deep into the stories of each of these uh, success cases in developing countries, and, and this is the new paper that I was talking about, which I haven't yet managed to complete, is that you see that each of these new, um, each of these players had different set of constraints and they, they leveraged different opportunities to capitalize the market. And one of the CEOs that I interviewed um, said something which always um, sticks with me. He said, the science is the easy part of the game. You know, it's not the science, you know, it's the rest that needs to come into place for us to succeed. So shaping markets there becomes very important to start looking at the market failure in the vaccine sector, as we see globally, and how do we shape market to promote regional and national innovation? And then how can we offer structured support to coordinate supply expansion with local production? These are some of the things that we've discussed in the paper. And um, with that, I'm going to stop and I look forward to the interaction. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was a fascinating talk and very much a tour de force through quite a lot of evidence and reflections on you know, not just uh, the specifics of the manufacturing of the vaccine, but I guess uh, that can be extrapolated to look at more broadly to the problem of industrialization, structural transformation to in many of these countries. And of course, there are a number of cases you mentioned too, and of course, probably one that is closer to my uh, interest and, and research is the one in, uh, in Brazil by Pio Cruz, where in fact a number of the uh, uh, ingredients that you put uh, up front in terms of building up ecosystems and that uh, kind of collaborative multi-platform type of arrangement, the idea of thinking about a future uh, market and regional demand for vaccine has been very much understood from the beginning. And that probably is part of the, the reason why there has been some success there. So very much look forward now to ask the, I, I refrain myself to keep asking or thinking or commenting or asking questions to Panashi. And uh, let me just, uh, uh, ask else to join the discussion at this point and to share some reflection uh, based on, on her own work. And then we will uh, try to open the floor uh, to, to, to further discussion. Else. Yeah, thanks so much. And I mean, Padma, th this was just amazing. It's like, uh, I, I, I want to continue working with you on many different issues because there are so many points of, of real interest. Um, trying to add to, because I mean, Everything you said, I, I think I, I agree with. Uh, you articulated so well. Um, but let me maybe say already, like where I come from is actually, I started um, from the innovation side. Innovation for access and where the, the part of production manufacturing is, is only one aspect. And I think it's important because I think that, I mean, I've been working for the past 20 years at the interface of uh, research and development uh, and 
policy advocacy around affordable access. And I, it mostly in the area of what we call neglected diseases. And so uh, an easy uh, uh, definition of neglected diseases is where there is a market failure. It's not always that, but in general, I mean, we turn to the, the term neglected because certain diseases are neglected by the market, by the pharmaceutical companies. And so when you start from a, from a, from a point of market failure, the question is, and that has been you know, the dominant thinking, how can we fix and shape the market? But after 20 years, I have come to a very different conclusion. I think that, and that's actually what links me also with uh, Mariana's work and, and the, the WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All. How can we shape the economy to serve our public health uh, goals? And so, that's actually a few things where I want to come back to, because if you talk about, you know, we, uh, uh, of course, technological capacity is, is critical, but everything you've, you've said is about how can we indeed uh, uh, have production, production and innovation, ideally, fantastic, but to what purpose? And I think that there, the purpose is not necessarily defined as what I think we should move to is we need medical innovation that is available and accessible to those who need it. A accessible meaning in an affordable way. And so I think what, what, what we really need to do is look at, a, at, at an end-to-end -end approach. We cannot address production and what you say, I mean, market access without linking it to the way we innovate. And so I think that this has been, uh, I mean, a mistake that we've all done kind of saying, well, innovation is one thing, and then how do we deliver access? And we have local production, as you said, I mean, from the time of the uh, antiretroviral drugs, I mean, there's been so many efforts that end up failing for all the reasons that you described, because then they have to compete with economies of scale from India uh, while they're still learning. I mean, all of that doesn't work, but also because we don't have the purpose at the heart of, of the efforts and the policy efforts. And, and I wanna make a quick link to what you say, Andre, Antonio, about Brazil. I think in Brazil, there have been much more efforts to actually develop technological capacity efforts for innovation as well as a strategic investment of the state to produce the medical innovation they need for the public health system. And I think that that is a really important uh, link to make. And when I see, and I think you've described it already, what I hear from the discussions about local production in, in Africa, it's not about, I've never heard anyone talk about how this will deliver available, affordable access for the African population. It's about markets and, and I mean, markets, people are not markets and the markets fail so far. And I think the limits of market uh, shaping are, I mean, you've already outlined some of them, certainly in the, in the vaccine field, where I think there is a market, but it's very in, difficult to get entry to that market because of the barriers that are so high. But in many other areas, eh, because neglected diseases, it's not minority diseases, it's actually in, in a, a continent like Africa, many diseases can be considered neglected. There is no, viable markets uh, to bring innovation uh, in an affordable way, except when there are donors like, you know, HIV with the Global Fund, Gavi, etc. And so I think what, we, what we, we need to do is to take a step back and really look at if we consider medical innovation pharmaceuticals as what we are now talking about, you know, global commons, global public goods, then we have to structure the whole set of uh, activities from innovation to manufacturing and a lot of the technological capacity building that you are describing, but with the purpose of delivering tools that can improve public health. And the only way they can do that is because they're available and affordable and accessible where needed. So I think that unless we link that very much to the, to the, to the purpose, the public health purpose, we kind of are going to get lost in translation because we will have maybe production, we will have supply, because supply of the vaccine is not delivering a vaccine to the people. People are not getting vaccinated with a supply, they're getting vaccinated because there is a vaccination program that has bought supply, that was financed, etc., and, and can deliver it. And I think that we need to really 
build that kind of technological capacity from from end to end with the purpose of, of uh, affordable and inclusive access. And that brings me to two important points. One is finance, you already mentioned that. And I mean, a lot of public finance has been going through, whether it's through the vaccines or in the area of neglected diseases. Uh, if there is no private, if there is no market drive to do either the innovation or even the, the production, there is a lot of public finance. But again, it's not structured to, uh, to the goal of delivering improved health outcomes. We always miss to do that link. And I think that that's one of the things with the, with the Economics Council uh, of the World Health Organization that we're trying to make clear. How can you structure finance such that you measure success of your investments and of your technological capabilities with improving health outcomes of the people and the market may not work. And it's, I mean, honestly, the markets, if you see in, in, in Western countries where we have, you know, health insurance, plenty of public health, public health systems, etc. There is a lot of public financing going into that, that whole thing. How can we imagine that building local capacity in Africa without having the supporting structures of the public finance, uh, both on the innovation uh, side, but also on the access side, we, we, won't have to, we won't be able to do that. And that brings me to another point of real importance is control and ownership. I think that, I mean, you mentioned intellectual property rights, um, but as long, I mean, the difference between Moderna or BioNTech setting up a factory in Rwanda or, or Senegal versus building local capacity that has an investment of the government towards public health goals, not just towards jobs. And maybe they can do both, but the primary goal needs to be public health goals. And that's, I mean, the European Investment Bank and, and all of them, that's not what they're talking about. They're building uh, business plans for markets. But what we need is actually built an end-to-end -end innovation with public-private partnerships but that are governed such that in the end public health outcomes can be improved and that means that uh, we, we should not consider pharmaceuticals as market commodities that we can uh, shape the market from but actually that they are common goods, public goods that contribute to the health of the population and I think that that's a very a different way of, of looking at that, but it's very complementary to everything you say, because I think you've described all the gaps. I think the solution is a much stronger political commitment that actually we want to, de to, to develop production and innovation capacity in the biomedical sector for public health, not for markets or business. And sometimes in certain areas, there may well be some market, but I think that that should not be the primary goal. And then you turn uh, the, the, the questioning uh, on its head, of course. Maybe one, one uh, final thing point, if I have two more minutes, uh, Antonio. Um, uh, you mentioned in, in West Africa, I happen to work indeed on a, on a project where we're trying to imagine uh, uh, whether it would be possible to build a, vi a viable business pro uh, proposition, uh, business plan, uh, no, uh, sorry, a value proposition because it's not a business plan because we know it's not going to be a viable business in the classic sense for the drug development and local manufacturing of a Lassa fever drug. Lassa fever is one of these hemorrhagic fevers in Western Africa. It's not a disease that has a lot of, uh, you know, patients, etc. There is no viable market for that. But can we, building also on the commitments that we hear from politicians in the region, uh, African Union and, and, and others, uh, to say, can we build a, a, a value proposition where there is public investment in the development and the clinical trials and all that is needed to bring that innovation? And there are several drug candidates there that are not taken, being taken forward now, but to do what is needed to, to actually get a drug approved, link that immediately to uh, local production capabilities that need to be built, but in a way that the region decides like, we think this is a worthwhile investment in the health of our people. And it will create jobs and it will create capabilities, et cetera. But that is the investment 
is in the health of our people. And we do not think that we need to have monetary return on investment. Actually, what we want is build capabilities and, and, and health goals. And so I think that that's going to be, and I'll be very interested to you know, brainstorm a little bit with you on, on, on opportunities of uh, how to, to move that thinking. I'll leave it here for now, and then I'm happy to continue engaging. Thanks, Els. Thanks, thanks so much. I think uh, we already have a comment here around the fact that David is in the detail when we talk, we talk about these issues. And of course, I would provocatively say, as you refer to the we, you now we want these type of things. But unfortunately, we have seen that that we didn't materialize in many cases. There's been lots of discussion about uh, creating, we want to create these things also at the level of the uh, African Union in general, uh, the international cooperation, but that has not really uh, resulted in something which leads me to reflect on the fact that there is a fundamental political economy here of development of these sectors. We like it or not, either we completely share with you uh, the perspective, we don't want to have the market regulating anything that is about health, uh, completely with you on that. But in the current scenario, uh, if we are thinking about how to uh, you know, address the more immediate problem and build foundation for the future, it's not the case that few crudes has managed to develop over the years, a value proposition that is also a business proposition, is a viable business, but has been part of an embedding and autonomy within the state, uh, which is quite rare to achieve. And I, I guess is uh, few groups is older than the state uh, itself in Brazil, right? So it's that capacity to build institutions that deliver that type of value proposition that I think we are concerned about. So that's the great that you brought in all this uh, uh, thoughts to the discussion. Padmashi, if you'd like to have a quick reaction, and then I will invite people to start uh, joining uh, the discussion. There is already Yanis uh, Latzdinis, uh, sorry, Latzdinis, uh, who raised a few points that maybe wants to, to join in a, in a second. Padmashi, would you like to react quickly? Yeah, very quickly. So many things to say, but a um, couple of thoughts. So uh, I mean, else I agree with everything you say, but I'm, I think I'm I'm getting um, I'm probably more cynical with every mm -hmm. passing moment working in this field. Is that so? When you I mean, decoupling R and D from profits is something that we should have done a long time ago, but we're not going to do it. I mean, we we need to do it, but I don't see a viable way that we can do it internationally. But I think we need to push for it. I think that a greater reinforced push of decoupling pharmaceutical R and D from profits, like you mentioned, is is absolutely needed. And there was this. I mean, I'm not uh, I'm not sure um, about the work of your group at WHO, but there was this. Um, this work previously at WHO on decoupling R&D from, from profits. And maybe it's really time to, time to revive that with gusto somehow to, to push for it. The second thing is that, you know, when we talk about global public health, and this is something that really irks me a lot when, when I do this, um, this, this kind of uh, data analysis, I don't think we talk about global public health, you know, we, you know, because when you talk to companies, they will tell you that they're doing this for global public health. So then the question is, how do we define global public health? You know, I mean, um, we seem to really have lost um, simple definitional clarity about things, you know, then equitable access. You know, I agree with you that we need to link everything to access, but equitable access includes actually early access for everyone. An aging person in a low income country is not different from an aging person in the US or Europe. Uh, and, you know, and, 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 and the health professional in a low income country should not be treated differently from one elsewhere but we have also lost the meaning of a term like equitable access and control and ownership um there is absolutely i i once again i mean i totally concur um in our paper we talk about using technology partnerships as development partnerships the idea that we should not um you know use technology partnerships as narrow-minded technology partnerships we have to use technology partnerships in the broader sense to really uh, PPPs to leverage control ownership and really decision making power in these sort of like contractual arrangements. So um, I, those are my few comments because I think I really want to hear from everyone else. Thanks, Pam Machine. I think the discussions start getting a bit more uh, specific also in terms of you know what we would like to see happening or what is is feasible in the current global uh, uh, setting, which, which has lots of uh, you know, uh, signs of hope, but also pessimism. 
so Fausto has uh, raised uh, his hand, so I'm going to allow him to join the discussion and to, um, Fausto, please. And then I will ask also Yanis if you would like to uh, share some points around Cuba and also the importance, of course, of national medicine regulatory authorities. And of course, in Africa, there has been an effort, I guess it was last year, then to build up a joint uh, authority uh, for across across the continent. Fausto first. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very insightful and interesting. I just wanted to ask you uh, about something that you mentioned. Um, so you mentioned that uh, with the introduction of TRIPS, uh, some pharmaceutical companies in Bangladesh were struggling uh, with a new regime because uh, it was more collaborative uh, than what they were used to. Um, I, I found it interesting. I don't know, well, could you elaborate on this and uh, what lessons uh, can be drawn from this, which you, you were referring to? Uh, that was not super clear to me. Thank you. Padmashi, would you like to get a couple of points before so you have time to collect uh, ideas and also to eventually combine some? I would like to invite Yanis as well to uh, raise the couple of points that you put in the chat. And of course, also the reference to the Cuban experience, which is also an interesting one in this discussion around who, who should be in charge of this uh, important uh, uh, sector. Yanis. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. You can. Yes, uh, first of all, regarding the point that I just wrote, of course, local production for local needs is very important. Uh, but uh, at the end, it's the national health regulatory authorities that will have to guarantee the quality of the products that are going to be produced. If that doesn't exist, it's a, it's a hard struggle. I just think about the recent recent you know, problem that the Russian manufacturers had in, in the Indian manufacturing site where the quality issues were raised, okay? So therefore, I mean, uh, we talk a lot about manufacturing, technologies, transfer, whatever, but if in the equation we don't put funds and don't put efforts in strengthening national regulatory uh, authority capacities, I think we will be always dependent on the approval of these products in or big international, big big national regulatory authorities outside the countries, or we will depend on the WHO requalification, and and again that complicates the situation, and I think that limits again uh, the the drive for initiatives to address own problems. The the other point I tried to raise was basically the you know it's it's always difficult to talk about the Cuban experience without without putting be behind the thought, this is political aspect. But while I was working at WHO, I had the opportunity to, to really get familiar with their ability and their capacity to address product. And as El said, their original goal was really to fill, to fill their, their health needs. Health needs that obviously were driven by political circumstances at the time. But the lesson there was really we have to strengthen ourselves. They produce all their all the pediatric vaccines that they needed. They produce medicinals that they needed. They strengthen their health authorities, and all that pretty much, you know, to a large extent, with, with building a very strong uh, academic curriculum, building a very strong uh, uh, educational program for people to get into that. You know, we talk about technology transfer, but if we don't have in our universities uh, something that can prepare people for this field, it just won't work because uh, you, you have to look at it in a very holistic way uh, to, to, to achieve these goals. So these were the two comments I wanted to say. And, uh, but, but again, I, I, think, I think it was very important the details that you brought into your conversation, because normally those are not seen when policies and political discussions are put forward. Thanks, Yanis, absolutely. And let me stress again, that it's so important to get uh, a, this type of perspective and see through the lenses of really production, innovation, manufacturing, you know, markets, uh, how firms themselves think about this issue in particular problem around the viability of some of these businesses. Uh, there was another uh, end raised by Arian Marty. If, 
uh, you'd like to still raise your question, I'd like you to join, and then we will give back the words to Padma Shri. Thanks. Um, thanks for the very insightful talk. Yeah, I just had a question on the mRNA vaccine, um, because given the current variants and COVID um, mutating at a very rapid speed, they say that mRNA is more useful than protein subunits. And my, my fear is, is that with mRNA vaccines, there comes this, uh, well, infrastructure problem, especially in a lot of LICs and LMICs. And like in the short term and in the long term, how can you really deal with it when you don't have, when there are a lot of electricity and infrastructure issues and how these issues need to be dealt first before these can be actually properly administered. And now even with COVAX, there's going to be a massive problem in absorption capacity because of these issues that haven't been addressed first. Um, and yeah, I can see the pharma industry trying to make a move for mRNA because it's in their advantage. You read a lot of articles and they say that mRNA really is the future and it can solve a lot of other diseases and illnesses. So yeah, Thanks, I'm Ari. just wondering how it's absorbed. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Now, this is a very important point. It's not just uh, what is feasible, but also what works best in what context. So, Palmashi, would you like to, to, to address these three set of questions? And eventually, else we will ask her as well. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so, I'm going um, to start with Fausto's question. Um, so, you, um, so, so, the example I gave was, uh, was not uh, Bangladesh, it was India, actually. So when India became fully compliant with uh, the TRIPS agreement in 2005, um, Indian firms were quite competitive and they had a significant amount of capacity to produce uh, generic versions of patented drugs. So the, the whole competition in the Indian market was actually um, brand name based. So they were used to mainly competing with one another. And the whole um, sort of industrial ecosystem, so if you take a look at the industrial ecosystem that supported the pharma sector, was not uh, geared towards uh, collaborative dynamics or facilitating R&D-based research that you needed for uh, different kinds of products and processes. So what, what the firms had major difficulties with was to sort of come out of these silos that when somebody introduces a drug, I'm a major competitor for this drug, which is how they had operated for 20, 30 years, to sort of trying to look at innovation as a more systemic thing where they could compete in some product categories, but they also could collaborate in some product categories. There was also this massive focus on just a sort of like, um, because generic drugs, when you produce them, you know, it's very process oriented. So what you're doing is that you have a certain process to produce a drug and maybe hundreds of, uh, I mean, I'll give you an example. You know, I once um, sat down with um, Bill Hamid, who was the CEO of Cipla Pharmaceuticals and we were having lunch and then uh, we were talking about a new HIV drug. And I said, but what are you going to do? Because it's all patented and all the process are patented and so on. And Hamid said, it doesn't matter to me. They can patent 100 processes. I'm going to find the 101st, okay? And that was the thinking of Indian firms, that they were going to find the new process and they were going to be the first to find this process and they had to invest into short product timelines because finding that process, not for recombinant drugs today or monoclonal antibodies, but really traditional APIs, and traditional drugs would take you anywhere between zero to two years, right? So the firms were thinking of production in a completely different way than the way we think about production today. And this is just 10 years later from, from then. And um, for them to shift gears to come here was quite difficult. And in the initial stages, policy making could have done more by setting different triggers and different incentives. Also, you know, to, um, to draw uh, on to Yanis's point, you know, also regulatory compliance requirements, you know, introducing different kinds of regulatory compliance requirements, training protocols. These are very useful ways of helping firms, signaling to them they need to start thinking about production differently. There are different ways of doing things. You know, these are important things. And I'm not trying to say that Indian firms didn't succeed. They're highly successful and they've made their way 
but they definitely, even firms um, in India had teething problems. So that's my point is that moving from production to innovation is not easy. And you have to somehow think of an industrial ecosystem that can facilitate this transition in a more easy way. Um, I mean, um, re regarding Yanis's point, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Although I, I would say that um, for me, the, the problem has um, many facets. So on the one hand, um, I mean, most when I when I uh, sort of look at counter the issue of counterfeiting in Africa, right? Um, and um, we've we've done many projects trying to uh, assess where counterfeited drugs come from in Africa. Most of them are not produced by African firms. They're actually coming from elsewhere, India, China, Bangladesh, and so on. They're 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 actually flooded in the market through other sources. Um, so one of the problems, um, and there I totally agree with you, is um, the regulatory uh, compliance mechanism and the capacity of the drug regulatory authority to control this is actually a very important way to ensure that there's enough space for uh, local firms to operate in addition to giving them the idea that they have to produce good quality drugs. Because sometimes when I do field work in Africa, I'm confronted by situations that firms are producing good quality drugs, but they don't have space in the market because it's flooded by other kinds of cheaper substitutes. And it's a, it's a market where you cannot uh, assess quality. So it becomes very difficult for these firms, right? And also you're competing with the general impression that imported drugs are better than locally produced drugs. So it becomes actually a really uh, um, um, an, an added layer to the problem. Um, that said, I also think that, um, and I, and I want to, yeah, your point that local authorities, drug regulatory authorities should come up with their own standards, I think it's very important because if you take the case of India or Bangladesh, or for that matter, actually, um, to a certain extent, other countries that, that are successful, uh, one of the things they did do is that the WHO pre qualification standards are quite high. And there's a lot of discussion about the fact that they're not entirely scientific. We don't know why they need to be so high. So one of the things that the local drug regulatory authorities in these countries did is to set an intermediate standard to signal high quality um, production, but that was slightly lower or different and, and easy for local firms to accomplish to make sure that it was a step in the process of building these sort of collective capabilities. And I think um, in Africa, this would be very useful, especially to consider under the auspices of the new African Medicines Agency, which they're actually now trying to put together. How far we can do that, I'm again, not very optimistic because AMA is heavily influenced by a lot of donor agendas. So um, there needs to be a little bit of struggle and a little bit of alternate thinking um, that needs to be sort of fed into those processes to, to bring this. To bear, I think, um, but that's that remains very important. Another thing with re regulatory compliance is that harmonization of regulatory processes in Africa, I think, is very important. Although in theory we have already done it or we have moved close to doing it, in practice, when I um, do surveys, I find that firms really have major difficulties in reality because different uh, national regulatory authorities are still working with different rules they're not really harmonized. So we need to somehow bridge this gap between, between theoretically or policy-wise having the rhetoric that we've harmonized and really harmonizing it in the field. Um, regarding Cuba, I think that, um, I think, I mean, I think that one of the things that, um, that really um, mattered for Cuba is really this focus on collective capabilities uh, through localized uh, sort of problem solving and a focus on localized innovation. I really like um, Simon Reed Henry's work on Cuba because it actually shows how the Cuban government has set up these um, these uh, institutes where actually these pools of knowledge of the kind that we really want to have for this kind of dynamic transformation was created for 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 sort of like cross fertilization of ideas and product development. Um, um, for Arian's question. It's a big problem. I think that um, there is the the mRNA um, you know train has 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 really left the platform, so to speak, in a, in very simple um, terms. Um, and big pharma is heavily invested in it. And um, the the problem that supports it is also the short product development type line, uh, timelines because for mRNA you can really have short product development type line, timelines this ability to tweak the product quite easily if there are new variants. And, you know, um, and this, um, 
And there's a vested interest, of course, because it's high investment, high tech, already extremely proprietary tech, which actually firms can build on. So it's uh, additional barriers for entry for any other firms, including the developing country vaccine manufacturers. So it gives special protection to big pharma and some other small niche players to keep technology and to sort of like, um, you know, secure markets. Um, that said, I think that it's important to, I think there is there is space to push in the sense that, um, I mean, of course, we are dealing with a pandemic and there's COVID-19, but there is a whole set of other diseases out there for which we have actually other vaccine platforms which might actually provide solutions, especially given that there is a space to create these markets in a different way from uh, a public health perspective. So in our paper, what we do is that we actually have a table where we look at all the front runner COVID-19 candidates. Um, they're split actually, as opposed to the hype, they're split across all the four platforms quite equally. Uh, but those who are in uh, the other platforms, they're a bit lagging behind because it takes a bit more time actually to do product development using other vaccine platforms. But then we try to show the, the sort of complementarities between those COVID-19 vaccine candidates and other um, needs from public health perspective to make the proposition that if you invest here, you can diversify here, here, and here. And these are actually markets that will need to be filled up in the coming years. So we look at it from a public health perspective and uh, um, orphan market perspective, so to speak. You know, so it's not an orphan drug, but here there are orphan markets. And how can we actually, you know, have sort of policy instruments that help us to fill these orphan markets? And um, yeah, I think that looking at that problem from that perspective is, is more helpful for the moment and to generate this information and constantly talk to policymakers, really to tell them that, you know, this is not the only thing that we need to do mRNA, but um, normal vaccine development is, is important. I think that's, um, that's useful. Thanks, Padmashi. Um I think there are going to be another couple of questions, and I would like us to bring back then else, because one of the two is looking very much at what else was mentioning. So may I ask Bea uh, to Beatrice Kira uh, to make her comment remarks more on the Brazilian case, and Patricia will come back uh, with a question around really the purpose nonprofit that Els talked about quite a lot. So I would like also to bring Els back to that one. Beatrice, please. Thank you so much. It was fascinating uh, presentation. It's been a fascinating discussion. And again, I want to ask again on the Brazilian case because I think it's a very interesting one where we had, uh, I'm Brazilian, so that's what I'm saying, we, we had two facilities that were producing vaccine against all political odds. And the discussion in terms of the uh, role of politics in pushing the production, but also in some circumstances acting as barriers, uh, is what I'm, I'm going to ask about. And so with, to which extent uh, do you think that building autonomy into the uh, systems of innovation is also important alongside building capabilities? Because I think one of the uh, hypotheses of why the Brazil, Brazilian case was successful against the odds in terms of the political uh, pressures was that those institutions had capabilities built from early on, but also very autonomous. So uh, just a question on the relationship between autonomy and capabilities uh, in the long term. Thank you. Thanks, Patrice. And of course, this is very much an industrial policy question. And at the extent to which this is possible in the African context, given the quite adverse political economy situation, I mean, I talked with partnership before about cases where we actually destroy drugs well uh, functioning and well not uh, you know drugs that could be injected in people to save their lives simply because the, there is a business behind that that makes more viable to actually destroy drugs and to import drugs from other places. Um, Patricia and then very quickly also for this last round uh, like Chia and then I will go back to Panashi and else for the last round of answers and comments. Patricia please. All right, thank you. I, this has been very fascinating uh, for me, especially um, being African um, and looking at the fact that Africa historically and continues to be seen as a market um, because of the popular, as a continent, it's seen as a huge market. So where's the incentive for big pharma really not to 
um, see Africa as a big market and um, by focusing on, um, on, on, on the people and, and on purpose of eradicating certain illnesses or diseases. I mean, beyond vaccine, I mean, this is about vaccine and COVID. Um, we know about illnesses like even um, sickle cell anemia, malaria, and all those sort of illnesses. Um, till today, uh, we don't have any solution regarding that because it's, no, it's not um, profitable. Whereas for malaria, there are a lot of fake drugs on the market um, treating and cause, um, supposedly trying to treat malaria, but causes death. A lot of people die from taking those fake drugs um, because they just can't afford to buy the, the original ones. So how do you, I mean, it's, it's all well and good and I'm all in, I, I, I buy into that because that's really the, the, the whole essence of, um, and what um, IIPP talks about and which is a mission approach and focusing on purpose. But really, how does that translate? Um, how do you translate that for big pharma? What would be the sort of suggestions um, regarding how they can um, be encouraged to focus on purpose rather than um, profit? Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. Um, and if we can keep it brief, so we have 10 minutes to, for the final round of answers. Uh, Lakshya, uh, sorry if I pronounce it wrongly. Uh, no, that's correct. Uh, thanks for that great discussion. I am I'm looking at the COVID vaccines in India, and I see when you look at these viral vectors, mRNA, all these frontier platforms, I see that most of those they are they have come from these foreign partnerships. And you know when I go and talk to these for some of these firms, and I ask them whether can you use the same technology for other other diseases or other, other vaccines? So their outright answer is no, we can't. It's their technology. And you know, when I think about this uh, value versus volume issue uh, and uh, this diversifying into other diseases, other vaccine, I think I then come back to Elle's point about, you know, I mean, it's really good to have this manufacturing capacity. Uh, it's all well and good, but ultimately, you know, you have to somehow uh, develop that innovation capacity so that you are not no more constrained by um, these IP issues where you can't use the technology for diversity, diversifying into other diseases. Thanks. Thanks so much. So we have three great last round of questions. Uh, uh, else, would you like to start with, you know, we can pick all of them, one of them, and then I'll last the last uh, words to Padmashri for, for, for that. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and um, I'm going to make a few points that address in different ways some of the questions. And, and the first one to say is that, and, and we must make, be careful to understand each other in terms of language, because when I say, well, I don't think that we need to think about the markets, it depends, of course, what you mean by it, because what we want to do is indeed that to have uh, governments shape whether you call it markets or I call it the ecosystem, the pharmaceutical innovation and access or innovation for access ecosystem, whether you call it a market or not, I think let's be clear, that is what we, we need. And I think that there is a formidable opportunity today because of COVID, because there has never been such an explicit massive public investment that has been put into the development and manufacturing uh, of uh, pharmaceutical tools, vaccines in particular, but even therapeutics and diagnostics. And we have today discussions uh, in the context of pandemic preparedness and response, where investment banks, I mean, whether it's the World Bank or regional investment banks, are willing to put massive amounts of money. So if we can structure that money, those investments, because those are investments in the economy uh, in ways that actually deliver that technological innovation production capability for access for public health. I think we, this is an opportunity we cannot miss. And I put into the chat uh, a link to the paper that the Economics Council yesterday launched actually that, that, that talks about financing for health for all to actually uh, uh, address ways in which we can do that by structuring much better the public and private relationships and uh, how can you get big pharma to 
think less about profits and more about public health? Well, because they, their policy environment is shaped by governments, including m many, many of the, the, the financing that is going to, towards them. So if we put much clearer conditionalities to have uh, public health and access uh, principles, no, not principles, outcomes at the end, I think there is a lot that, that we can do there. Um, and so linking that to, to some of the discussions about mRNA technology and others, I do think we, we should um, use again that opportunity to also leapfrog technology because we have often been thinking and the previous thinking about manufacturing is well, you have to start with the easy thing and then gradually build it. Yes, obviously you can't just uh, jump into the most sophisticated uh, things, but technologies have also evolved, have miniaturized, for instance, you can now on a much smaller scale produce what used to require big factories and trying to see, I mean, if you see how in Africa or in other parts of the world, uh, mobile technologies have been used in much more innovative ways than what we are honestly doing in Europe uh, around banking and FinTech, et cetera. Um, I think there is an opportunity to leapfrog much more, but again, to drive it with the, the purpose of creating technology platforms that are versatile instead of going from uh, one technology or, or one product and trying to uh, copy it or make it. I think we need to focus on technology platforms. I mean, mRNA technology is one. Uh, I think monoclonal antibody technology. Honestly, if you have the platform technology, then there is a lot of opportunity to actually innovate uh, with that, that you don't have to kind of copy uh, whatever you mirror, but you can actually relatively easy now that we've identified what the antigen is, et cetera, you can relatively create, easily create other uh, antibody therapies. And so I, I think we, we should actually uh, be, be very uh, ambitious now that that momentum uh, is there. And maybe one final point to make is that in terms of new um, uh, COVID vaccines, I think it's going to be extremely difficult to, to get new, uh, like the, the, the second uh, line and third line vaccines onto the market because it's impossible to do clinical trials in a, a comparative clinical trials and it's no longer possible to do placebo controlled trials. So I think there are major entry barriers that are now actually already in the R&D in the clinical trial area that it's going to be extremely difficult to move new products forward, uh, which is kind of not so optimistic note. I'm going to stop here because I'm running out of time. Thanks, Els. Padmashi, you have the last two, three minutes. Uh, lots of big questions, so we can take a bit more than two, three, but we will have to close pretty soon. Okay, thanks. Thanks, uh, Antonio. So yeah, on the question of autonomy and capabilities uh, that Beatrice asked about, you know, um, yes, we can go on forever, right? Because, I mean, there's a question, I mean, the internal, um, you know, um, ambition to build capabilities um, for countries, particularly in Africa, is a constantly stymied, I would say, right? By a lack of autonomy to decide how to do it. And that's the global political economy in which we operate. And this is becoming increasingly evident and particularly in the pharmaceutical and vaccine sector. And that is a major issue for political economy to solve, and it's a major issue for industrial policy to strike back against. And I firmly believe that if we don't do that, right, this internal push towards building capabilities is going to lead to nothing because you're always in a sort of a, you always find yourself, you know, in a in a sort of a wider context where what you're trying to do is going to materialize into nothing. Right, and 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 that's something um, we need to unpack. I think much more clearly in the context of of uh, of this um, of this sector. Um, I, the second question is, um, you know, Patricia, your question is. Yeah, Africa is the largest market. It will remain. It's actually right now it's uh, forecasted to be the one um, as big as one fifth of the total global market in the coming years. This doesn't mean, though, that big pharma is going to focus on the needs of African people. What it really means, probably, is that big pharma is going to channel its existing drugs for African people in, in areas that applies most and where they can have maximum sales. 
this also once again means that they're going to really sort of rely on the growing income capacity of African um, consumers, basically, and not on uh, you know trying to make drugs um, affordable or accessible by any uh, by any uh, any standard. Now, how can we make it more purpose or value driven? I'm not working at IAPD, so I'm not going to answer that question. But what I'm going to say is more that no, this is um this for us is is giving a big opportunity because everywhere else where actually um, innovation capacity was built in this sector, the domestic market played a key role, right? And um, previously in Africa, the domestic market was the major impediment actually for building capacity. If you take the problem with the HIV AIDS, this was a um, you know impediment. And I think that this is where we need to leverage the market size. And that brings me to my, um, to my point on markets, for me, you know, um, a market is, there is, there is no market failure, uh, or so, wait a minute, um, let me rephrase that. So for me, there are sufficient market failures in the global pharmaceutical market to justify all governments worldwide to enter and shape the market in the direction of public health. Now, if there are certain governments that do not want to do so, it's their choice, right? But I don't want to hear in any debate that we're only going to do it for neglected diseases or we're only going to do it here. No, we just need to do it. And in low and middle income countries, this gives us the best way in to shape the market. How can we make big pharma purpose driven? I have some ideas. One is competition. So I think competition could still be leveraged. So if you introduce new levers to make, to use other firms, say developing country vaccine manufacturers or your own firms, cater to public health objectives in certain way and you create your markets and shape them actively, okay? Then this kind of competition can be very useful to make big pharma rethink the profit driven model. And I think this is much more useful than regulatory push to dealing profits from R&D because that has not worked. So I would use a different mechanism. Another thing to do would be really to use different structural levers, move away from the IP system, think about prices. Why not consider patent buyouts? Why are we not buying out patents from Moderna or Pfizer and BioNTech? And why are we not putting pressure on governments for patent buyouts? In the US government, uh, um, there has been two cases actually of patent buyouts in two states, right? And I'm right now trying to write a piece with colleagues on how can we have patent buyouts in the global pharmaceutical market? So that's one way to do it. And for the last um, question on innovation capacity and why Indian firms cannot use the technology, well, that's the problem with the voluntary licenses, right? It's um, These are licenses that have been struck with these uh, manufacturers simply because they give the best way out for firms that have the proprietary technology to say, don't force me to license this technology through compulsory licensing. I've already voluntary licensed it to somebody and they're already producing it in the interest of public health. But what we don't see is what are the terms of these licenses because they're never made public, right? And this is a problem. That much contract manufacturing is not leading to innovation. So we really need to think about it in a, in a different way. So those are my sort of words. Uh, Thanks, Madhushree. I, I think I think we go back also in circle because you started, of course, with massive concentration in this industry and the fact that you could have more actors, including the government, acting uh, deliberately in the innovation production and food cycle and and creating more space. Uh, yeah. And it's interesting how you know all the data you showed us, you know, points in fact on the opposite direction. So we have to be very careful in pushing this argument forward. So thanks so much again for this fantastic talk, and thanks else for also joining us and, and sharing your thoughts and animating all the discussion. And thanks everyone who joined tonight. The event is going to be recorded. So for those who couldn't join, uh, this will be in our uh, uh, YouTube channel. Um, thanks again. And we will be again together in a couple of weeks time with another talk uh, as part of this similar, similar series. Everything is uh, advertised online. So hope to see you again next time.